Hello. Greetings, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good following morning. It is AMA number 10. Today is the 21st of May. Very hard to keep track as always. Hopefully we'll have a very interesting conversation today. I have a fantastic, fantastic guest, uh, Paul Anticoni, who has been a, uh, a mentor and a real inspiration for me as, uh, as I've been the director here at the JCC. Paul is the CEO of World Jewish Relief, the organization that built uh, JCC Krakow. So it's gonna be a lot of fun talking to him in a few minutes. We'll uh, have a little few things to talk about before that and answer your questions. And then we'll get to Paul Anticoni. Zach Davidson, see who's, uh, who's in the house today. Zach Davidson, the travel guru. If anybody, once we start traveling again, Zach Davidson is a miles guru. Uh, and we can, uh, you can uh, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with Zach if you wanna figure out how to fly all around the world for free as uh, Zach does. Benji Lovett, green t-shirt fanatic, Benji Lovett. And Jeffrey Rolat, oh, our core, the hardcore fans are here. That's the brain trust. Before uh, and after every episode, I get Benji and uh, Jeffrey on the phone and go over things. Good to see you guys. Benji in Israel and Jeffrey in Sherman Oaks and Vicki Warner. Vicki in the house. Hello, Victorious Warner, head of our Friends of Organization, making sure that the JCC can keep going. Good to see you guys, everybody. Let's see what's going on this week for us uh, in terms of what's in Poland. What's been new in Poland? Big changes this week. Stuff has started to open up. So restaurants are open. Um, different uh, cultural uh, institutions have been open. Hairdressers, beauty salons, gyms not open yet. Public transportation has increased in terms of how many people are doing that. Uh, allowed to go on trams and buses. But really, the city is starting to come back to life. Uh, there. When Kashmir, I've talked all the time about how empty it is walking around. It's like a ghost town because there are so many tourists and students that are here. Uh, uh, but now Kashmir is starting to come back to life. People in the restaurants and the pubs. Uh, so it's been, uh, I guess, positive to see that. Uh, well, hopefully we'll see in a couple of weeks once the numbers come in with Corona, if that was actually a smart time to reopen or not. We're all kind of flying blind here. So hopefully that makes sense. Good morning, Marcel Zielinski. Marcel. Our ride for the living hero, Marcel Zielinski, there in Montreal with Marilla. Always good to have you guys uh, there. We miss you guys here in Krakow. Uh, so very, very good to see you. In terms of where we are statistic-wise, in terms of Poland, last week we were at 17,400 cases. Now we're at 19,700. So partially that's just a lot of people getting corona for us. Uh, and I think there's just more testing. You're starting to see commercial testing available which wasn't available before, which is uh, a, big, a big deal. Uh, eight, last week, 869 dead and now 962. So 100 people in Poland lost their lives. Uh, tragic uh, numbers. Uh, looking at Poland in terms of the big picture, there are 38 million people here. So you guys can do the math versus the USA versus Israel. U uh, Israel has a similar amount of cases, but much fewer deaths. And I would say that's... Uh, just a result of uh, Israel having a little bit of a better medical uh, system than we have here in Poland. Poland is pretty good. There's free, there's healthcare for everybody, free healthcare for everybody, which is fair and which is good. And I just think Israel, you maybe have a little bit of a higher level. Hi, Alicia in Milwaukee, where I was supposed to be last week. I, it's too upsetting for me even to talk too much about Milwaukee. Uh, Laurie in LA, how you doing, Laurie? And Sita with my dad. Ah, very special. My dad is watching. So this episode, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the trauma of being raised Orthodox since my father is watching. Luckily, we've uh, in the past nine episodes dealt with a lot of my, uh, a lot of my issues. And uh, now I can just say very positive things. Uh, so hi, dad. Very nice to see you out there. By the way, I shouldn't give it away, but my dad thinks that I'm on TV with, uh, with Facebook. So uh, dad, there are tens of millions of people watching this. Dad, you should be very proud of your son. He's a TV star. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody correct, please. Hi, Marek Handwerker, good friend Marek here in Krakow. 
So we get people from all over. Excellent to see. Uh, the big news for us this week in the JCC, and this is huge news, is drum roll. We have reopened Frida, our preschool, our first Jewish community preschool to open since the Holocaust in its third year of activity, uh, closed in the, begin, in the middle of March, and we opened it on Tuesday. So we've been open for three days. Things are going very, very well. It's unbelievable to, uh, to see the regulations and what we've had to go through in the building to open the, the preschool. So maybe I can just give you a little bit of a, a picture of it because it's interesting, I think. So the gate is closed all the time. We have somebody at the gate letting the parent walk their kids in. The, parent, the parents have, there are arrows on the, on the pavement once you're inside the gate because the parents have to walk in one way, walk out another way. Then the parents bring their kids up to the first door of the JCC, hand them over to the security guard who takes the kid's temperature and uh, disinfects the kid's hands. Then the security guard brings the, the parents say goodbye. The child goes with the security guard in the elevator and only the Friday kids and teachers are allowed in the elevator, no one else brings the child up to Frida on the first floor and hands the child off to somebody who's in the ante room. There's kind of a, a room uh, entry into Frida who then takes the coat off and everything uh, and, and this disinfects the kid's hands and they take the temperature again. And then the kid goes past onto the teachers who are waiting inside the preschool. So it's something like a Fort Knox type situation here with the kids coming in and out of the building, but it's wonderful, really, really wonderful to see kids in the building. I don't go into Frida, we're keeping it really sealed. So those of us who are coming to the building at all are not going into the preschool, but still it's wonderful, wonderful to have the kids in the building. And I can hear the voices coming when they out in the playground. I hear the, you know, the little children's voices in the building, which is very, very nice, very nice for me. So, hey, Saul, good to see you, Saul Schachter upstate. Richard, parts unknown. Always I never know exactly where you are, Richard. Maybe in the Northeast somewhere, but who knows? The lovely Kasha Leonardi. Hi, Kasha. See you at home later. Uh, so that's been excellent for us. Uh, Friday opening, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I, although things have opened up here in Poland and restaurants are open, personally speaking, I'm still walking around all the time with a mask. I am not myself. Uh, Kasha and I aren't going into restaurants and really trying to limit the uh, limit contact with people. I think that we'll really have to wait two weeks from the time that things opened up to understand what the results are to see if this, this really made sense. So on some level, I'm happy that things are starting to get back to normal. It's just always with a little bit of trepidation that, this, uh, that it was the right time to do this. Uh, see Rabbi Avi, hi Rabbi Avi, Linda Fishman, hi Linda. Hope Chuck is also watching. Uh, so that's where we are in terms of Poland and what's going on with the news. Let's get to your questions. First, how's the Friday opening going? Very good question. I talked a little bit about it just now. Friday opening is going extremely well. I think we had, uh, it started, uh, we can only have, I think, up to a certain amount of kids. Uh, actually, I know because of the spacing regulations now. So now we have uh, I think it's up to eight kids. The first day we had four kids, the second day six kids, and today seven kids. So we're just about to uh, at our new capacity Friday, if you haven't been, is very, very small. Uh, and we have uh, seven there, seven today. So we're just about at capacity. Boker or Linda says Boker Tov. Good morning, Linda Krar. Happy birthday, Linda. You had a birthday the other day. So uh, the Friday opening is going very, very well. We're happy to see it full. I, I, I came in, the parent, it's also, I forgot to mention earlier, it's a shortened day. So instead of a full day, the kids are here from 9 a.m. till 2 p.m. So uh, the parents dropped them off by nine. Uh, so I was here the first couple of days that we did that. I made sure to be here and greet the parents. It was a very special time for us to be able to, uh, to see that happening and wanted to reassure the parents that everything's going well, uh, and it is. Uh, what's interesting is that we have to have also the teachers can't all be working at once because if a teacher gets sick, then they have to go into quarantine. So we actually have half the teachers are at home and half the teachers are working now and they can't have any contact with the kids during that two week period. So it's lots and lots of regulations, but I'm happy to see it that way and, uh, and things are going well. 
So the next question, what are the next steps for the JCC? Uh, of course, the ultimate goal, as we all know, world domination. We're working toward a world domination via JCC Krakow. Corona has only slightly uh, derailed our world domination plans. The next steps uh, for JCC Krakow, hopefully as the government allows us and as it makes sense for us uh, it, to be prudent about the opening, we'll, we'll reopen, reopen uh, the center. There are really, as I've talked about before, a preschool, a senior citizen center, a cultural center, and then in the office aspect of what's going on. So as of now, we've uh, reopened Friday and we'll see about the other, the other parts, I guess, as we get the statistics coming in from the government in terms of what uh, Corona and what the COVID-19 situation in Poland is, then we'll know how much we can reopen. I, um, you know, you feel that you don't want to relapse. So I would rather, you know, do the slow and steady and not rush into opening things. And then we can see, uh, see how it goes. And, but hopefully, of course, the next steps for the JCC eventually opening the building, getting things back to normal, continuing to welcome people who are just finding out they're Jewish, uh, welcoming them back into the Jewish world, taking care of our survivors, taking care of our teenagers, having our students come in and drive us crazy as they do. Uh, but getting back to normal, I think, is the goal for, for the entire world. So let's see about that. Hopefully, we'll get there. Mark Baranek, the mayor of Miami Beach. Good to see you, Mark. Unfortunately, Mark, Kasha's not here today, it's only me. I know you're tuning in just to see Kasha, but no Kasha, no Kasha today. Haley Warner, any ride for the living updates? Oh yes, that's an excellent question, Haley. I'm gonna answer that. Hi, Shana. Good to see you, Shana. Ride for the living update is, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, we are about to go live with virtual ride for the living. We're gonna announce that I think officially it's gonna go out. We're gonna roll it out next uh, on Sunday or Monday, I think Monday, uh, which is a program that anybody can participate in. You don't have to fly here to Poland. Obviously people aren't flying and it's not the easiest thing automatically just get on a plane and come to Poland at the end of June. But virtual ride for the living is something anybody can do. You sign up for virtual ride for the living. Uh, I think if you, if you pledge a certain amount, we'll send you a ride for the living jersey. Uh, this year's 2020 jersey, beautiful jersey. And, uh, but if not, no problem. You don't need the jersey to do it. And we, uh, you could have a fitness goal. The idea is based on 60 miles, which is the distance, the bicycle ride distance between Auschwitz and JCC Krakow. So we want everybody to sign up. You have about a month to do your fitness goal of 60 miles. If you want to set a higher goal, you can set a higher goal. If 60 is too much, you can do it less. But the idea is that you run, bike, or walk the 60 miles. And then we all finish together on July 5th, which is a Sunday. The Ride for the Living would have been finishing on a Friday during the actual ride, but this year we're gonna do it on a Sunday so more people can participate. So if you wanna just do, not do anything the whole month and stay indoors and then on July 5th, ride the 60 miles or walk the 60 miles, uh, however you wanna do it. You can do it up, do it during the month or do it all in one day, however you want. But we just wanna get a lot of people who can help us, one, raise money, but beyond raising money, we want to raise awareness that Jewish life continues in Poland, that Jewish life did not end in the Holocaust. And just uh, also, it's a nice idea, a nice way, I think, to, for people to get fit. Many of us have been stuck at home and haven't been able to get that much, uh, that much exercise. So I think virtual Ride for the Living is a great way for to keep our Ride for the Living family connected, to grow our Ride for the Living family. And those of you who've been on the ride do understand that it's been, uh, that it is a family and also uh, just stay connected and, and become part of the Jewish rebirth of Poland. So we'll, we're gonna send that out uh, through all our social media and email on Monday. So look out for that, be ready. Hope that you guys will, will join us and get your friends. Anyway, no, there's no barrier. So we're looking for, we're hopefully hundreds and thousands of people can really be, be part of Virtual Ride for the Living this year. Uh, are we doing anything? I'm gonna take one more question and then we're gonna go to Paul Anticoni, my very special guest. Uh, are we doing anything for Shavuot this year? Eating ice cream. We're gonna eat plenty of ice cream. I'm sure Kasha will be having plenty of ice cream for Shavuot. Of course, we traditionally eat dairy. So what are we doing at the JCC for Shavuot? We're gonna have a special uh, Tikkun Leil Shavuot. We're gonna do a, uh, like a learning session starting. We're actually gonna do it Saturday night 
starting with Havdalah and then have a bunch of speakers and different sessions about Jewish life in Poland. So we'll put all that out there on our social media and uh, through in our newsletter. So we have a very special plan for Shavuot. I actually am doing something for the JCC of Manhattan. Going to be one of the speakers. Uh, there are three speakers, one from Mexico City, one from India, and me uh, reporting in from Poland. We're going to do a talk with Smedar Barakivo, who is the CEO of JCC Global. And the four of us are going to talk about uh, Jewish life in our, in our communities around the world. Just to remind people, sometimes Americans, not you guys, of course, but some Americans can often not remember that there's Jewish life outside of just the axis of Israel and the US. So we're going to report in from other places. Very exciting to work with our uh, friends at the JCC Manhattan. So that's going to be on the 28th of May, I think. It's midnight Eastern time. I will get up at 6 a.m. the next morning uh, to do that. Of course, I'm up every day at 6 anyway, obviously. Uh, I don't really sleep much, so that won't be such a problem. So that's something we're exciting to do, excited to do, that i am uh, be participating in. So Shavuot coming up, big holiday for us. And also we're doing uh, Seven at Night, our program. Uh, if those of you who don't know about it, Seven at Night is an exciting thing we do here. Like we do Night of the, night of the uh, Museums in other cities. So in Krakow, we do Night of the Synagogues. We have seven renovated pre-war beautiful synagogues. And we do every year, we do a tour of those synagogues and we have different cultural activities going on in each synagogue. This year, of course, none of that is possible. So we're doing virtual, well, we'll call it seven at night, but it's really virtual seven at night. We're gonna have a fantastic tour guide who's gonna go and go to each synagogue and talk about it, uh, what's going on in the synagogues, what the synagogues are like, the history of the synagogues. And then we are going to show footage from previous previous year. So it's a cool way to stay, stay involved. Benji Levitt didn't realize there was Jewish outside, Jewish life outside of Krakow. I know Benji, uh, in Israel, it's easy to forget that there's Jewish life uh, anywhere but Krakow. Krakow's made quite a name for itself. So uh, uh, very good to, I, I see that. And, and uh, Haley's birthday, July 5th, very good birthday to have. Ride for the living this year on Haley's birthday. We did that especially for you, Haley. Uh, so uh, now no excuse not to not to be involved, but you were going to be involved anyway, Haley, weren't you? We know. Uh, I'm going to get now, let's get to my guest. I would probably be lying under a bench somewhere if it weren't for my next guest or my only guest today. Today's guest, uh, Paul Anticoni has become a great friend to me, really a mentor. Paul is the CEO of World Jewish Relief, which is a fantastic organization. Uh, the, some of you in America don't know about World Jewish Relief. Uh, it's a little bit like the JDC, it's kind of doing, it's a, maybe the overseas British arm uh, of uh, the overseas philanthropic arm of British Jewry. And Paul has been the CEO there for, we'll hear about it, I think about 12 years. And I'm gonna welcome my guest, Paul Anticoni, who is, In London, we're even we're even dressed alike. How are you, Paul Anticoni, today? Oh, I don't hear you, Paul. All good. Oh, there we go. To see you all. Excellent to see you, Paul. Paul, are you are you you're home now? I'm at home, but I've brought the branding obviously home with me. Uh, I'm sitting in my office, uh, my back room. I've got the my dog uh, on my left. Uh, my kids upstairs. My wife's at work. Excellent. I see. I, I, my, I have to put my dog in another apartment when I when I do something for my house. You have to see a little better at dog training than I am. So, Paul, tell us first before anything, Paul Anticone. Anticone is an interesting name, and I think people think it's Italian, but it's not. Maybe tell us about the, the name Anticone. Um, <clears throat> as much as I know, my my grandfather, uh, uh, Yusuf Anticone, came from born in Istanbul. Uh, came to England in 1920 as an economic migrant refugee. He was a cigarette roller, a Turkish cigarette roller, uh, settled in the east end of London amidst the Jewish community, joined the Spanish and Portuguese community. So I think the name is, um, I mean, the family's uh, uh, Turkish, one half of the family from Turkey, one other half of the family from Salonika, uh, um, obviously of uh, Spanish and Portuguese origins in the 1490s. Um, 
the name I think traditionally would have been written in Ladino. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, there are other parts of the family, Anticuni, the Vav can be Anticoni or Anticuni. Um, but it's definitely, I definitely feel a Mediterranean ingredient there. Absolutely, you have that, you have that Mediterranean vibe, Paul. So your fans, I see here on Facebook, your fans are, uh, your fans are uh, writing in. Agneshka Gish, Vicky Warner, people greeting you. Hi, Bobby, uh, Sebastian, everyone, everyone saying hi to Paul Anticoni. Uh, so you're the, Paul, you're the CEO of a really a phenomenal organization that, that gave birth, if you will, that birthed the JCC, that conceived of the JCC and, 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 and set it up. So we'll get, to those, we'll get to those days in a minute. Maybe talk a little bit about World Jewish Relief, what you guys are doing today. Well, it really is a, a special organization. Uh, in many different ways, and I, uh, uh, while I, it is a, a modern, forward-thinking, uh, a progressive institution, we are, we are deeply influenced by our history. Uh, in the 1930s, this organization, with the backing of the British Jewry and the British public, uh, took a bold step to start rescuing Jews from uh, Eastern Europe from 1933 onwards, taking great risks to help people escape. Uh, come to Britain, settle in Britain, or go onwards to Palestine, or onwards to third countries. Um, and at that stage, it wasn't just about rescuing people and leaving them here. It was about helping them find schooling, find training, find apprenticeships, find jobs, earn a living, and look after themselves so they didn't need our help going forwards. And I think that's been very much a premise of, of our work today. Uh, 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 today, World Jewish Relief, I mean, really, we do three things. We support um, elderly, vulnerable elderly individual, Jewish individuals to live out the remainder of their lives with some dignity, both, both physical and emotional support there. We help people get back into work so they can earn a living and not need further handouts. And, and predominantly that work is again amongst Jewish communities in the former Soviet Union. And then we're very proud to be working beyond the Jewish community, uh, responding to the needs of victims of disaster whether that be conflict or natural disaster or heaven forbid pandemics, should they ever occur, um, to be able to pick up their lives, rebuild their assets and their livelihoods and, and, and look after themselves. And, um, you know, that proud 80, you know, 87 year history, uh, um, which has been brave and challenging and has seen some absolutely heroic episodes, I think is, is fundamentally premised on a desire to change people's lives and livelihoods, not with handouts, but with sort of long-term sustainable interventions. Maimonides' eight levels of tzedakah ring very strong to us. Um, and, and I think the story of the Jewish Community Center in Krakow is, is an, a, a brilliant example. As, as we all know that story, I hope, my, my royal patron, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, who is an absolutely phenomenal individual, uh, co conceived of the idea. Uh, we helped pick it up and run with it. We had this even better good fortune to recruit the quite remarkable Jonathan Ornstein, uh, and I'm not paid to say that. Um, and this institution has picked up the reins, run with it, become a, a phenomenal success in its own right, to the extent that World Jewish Relief now learns from it about how you engage with community and how you bring people together. Um, and it can stand on its own feet. And I think um, it's just one, it's one indicator of our success. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're honored uh, to, to, you know, to be part of the World Jewish Relief, under the World Jewish Relief umbrella, and to have really grown as our relationship has changed from, from the early days when we just, you know, you sort of everything came from World Jewish Relief to these days that we're more of a partner organization, which is a very special, very different, very different relationship. Um, so two things that you mentioned that I want to go into a little bit, uh, a little deeper. One, you talked about in the 1930s, but you, with the details that maybe you didn't talk about were that World Jewish Relief was, uh, was then called the Central British Fund for German Jewry, and the saving Jews uh, in, in, on their Nazi occupation was the kinder transport. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit. I think people might not have, Americans may not always have heard of World Jewish Relief, but I think all American Jews have heard of the kinder transport and might not know the connection that that's, that that's you guys. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, I mean, the origins of the organization in 1933, a group of very uh, uh, influential uh, Jewish uh, uh, um, 
solely it was exclusively men, I don't know why, uh, uh, recognised the need to make some additional efforts to resource those that were looking to flee uh, um, uh, Nazi Germany. And it was, it, was, it was founded as the Central British Fund for German Jewry, actually. It was a fund. It was clearly a pot of money to, to help resource people that wanted to leave, not necessarily to escape then, to, elite, to, to, to leave. Uh, um, I mean, as pressure grew in Germany and Austria, uh, um, by 1938 and, and really uh, um, uh, uh, post Kristallnacht, uh, I think a real recognition that an emergency measure needed to, to take place and, and the Central British Fund for German Jewry, this my predecessor organization, along with other organizations, the Quakers and other parts of British Jewish community made representation to the British government to do everything we could to rescue. I mean, I think at that stage, something like 100,000 Jewish children and get them out and bring them to the UK and, and onwards to, to either to stay here or onwards to third countries. Uh, and um, I think for various different reasons, I mean, there were many hurdles, many political barriers, as we see today in, in the movements of people seeking sanctuary, sadly. Uh, um, uh, but, dis, uh, but, but alongside other faith organizations and other institutions, government relented and said, okay, you can start to bring Jewish children into the UK, but not, uh, um, but not, they cannot be the burden of the British taxpayer. And therefore we, 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 we asked uh, the British jury and our public to fund it. Um, and over that, you know, over that 12 months before until, until war broke out, we, we succeeded in bringing just under 10,000 Jewish children to Britain and, and, and the children on the kinder transport still well, became a central and brilliant part of global Jewry with many, many famous successful individuals. I think we look back at that time uh, with a, a little bit of uh, a celebration, but probably with a lot of regret that we didn't bring more. Uh, um, and, and I think again, it informs, it informs me a lot today that we, we don't as, as institutions ever want to be looking back and saying, I wish we'd done more to save life. And it is a reminder that my, my, my trustees and my staff keep, keep ringing loudly. I should add that post-war, uh, um, another uh, significant achievement for, for the Central British Fund for World Jewish Relief, we didn't change our name to World Jewish Relief, I think until 1984, I think it was, but another achievement was uh, petitioning government to enable Britain to accept a thousand children under the age of 16 in 1945 to, to be rescued from the displaced camps, the, the liberated camps, and bring them, bring them to Britain. Um, and uh, uh, the British government, uh, again, uh, uh, relented. I mean, sadly, we couldn't find a thousand children under 16 that had survived, and we were able to bring 732. They were known as the boys, but it was both boys and girls, um, of whom I'm sure we all know Sir Ben Helfgott as one of many, well, all 732 brilliant, outstanding individuals. Um, and uh, I mean, we celebrate this year, 75 years since they arrived in the north of England and again became pillars of our global Jewish community. Many of whom are still involved with, uh, with World Jewish Relief today. Many of whom are still involved. I mean, one of the, one of the interesting stories is I, I often get accused, Jonathan, as I think you might do, that we're, we're, we're quite aggressive in our fundraising today. You know, we, we, we really have a need to assist people to build community and it gives you and I some license to ask people in quite in quite a bold way to help us do our do our duty. Um, but in the 1930s, the Central British Fund was even more aggressive in its fundraising. And on a weekly basis in the 1930s, the Central British Fund for World Jewish Relief would print in the Jewish Chronicle, which is the the, the weekly Jewish rag within British Jewry, which influences us greatly, would print on a weekly basis a list of all the names of those that had donated to the organization that week with the sum that was given. Mm. Uh, the reason being that wasn't necessarily a celebration of that they'd given, but it was highlighting the list of names that weren't on that list and needed to give for next week. And I, I've long thought that was a brilliant idea, maybe a bit insensitive today, 
I was going to say it's better than had they had they just published the names of the people who didn't. <laughs> so we can be uh, weekly. So all, all of, for any of our for any of our JCC donors listening, you're going to get a weekly weekly uh, phone call from us. No, <laughs> no, it's a very proud history, and I think that really informs what you're doing today. And one of the things that I, as I've you know sort of been part of, of, of you know this relationship with JCC Krakow and World Jewish Relief and and watching you guys from you know quasi insider uh, status has been the idea of how much we as Jews are responsible to do uh, for how much of our philanthropy should be focused on non-Jews. And I know that you've taken some uh, at times unpopular stances, some uh, controversial stances. I think that, you know, we can, when, there, when there's a country that's neutral and that every, nobody has any problem with and we're going to help them, then it's an easy decision. But you've, uh, you, you, I know you, you've done work with Syrian refugees, which is, uh, and continue to do, which is a lot more uh, complicated. So maybe can you talk a little bit about the non-Jewish work that, you, that you're doing, especially places like Syria, and how that plays in the British Jewish community and your constituency there? Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I'll just correct you, Jonathan. You referred to the term non-Jewish programming. Well, successive chief rabbis, in, in, in Britain have always reminded me that everything we do, whoever we help, whatever their identity, is Jewish programming. And, and that means that means an enormous amount to me. My, my early charitable days with the International Red Cross was all about the, the, the primary fundamental principle of humanity. If somebody needs help, you help them. You don't ask for their passport or their identity or their uh, 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 ethnicity before you decide on the intervention. You help them. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that that culture is is deeply embedded with this in us all, for those of, of faith, where I think wanting to help just comes quite spontane spontaneously. Of course, we haven't got the resources to be everything to everyone everywhere, and we have to prioritize. And therefore, uh, um, really over the last 12, 13 years, one of the pillars of this institution has been when there is a global emergency, we want to show the world that not only do we care about the world and the people within it, but we will act on that care and respond to meet certain needs. And you're right to say when, a, uh, when an earthquake hits Nepal or a hurricane hits Haiti, it may be... Uh, um, natural instinct to want to help and a pleasure to be able to help through a Jewish channel and fly a Jewish flag above that assistance. That's not the reason we do it, but it shows the world that we are an immensely caring community. But then at times when people are affected by disaster that come from contexts that may be less politically savory, I suppose, to ourselves or the state of Israel, there are some tough calls to play, and, and, and often it's just simply come down to, again, a question of humanity. humanity. We tend to prioritise and focus our support on the needs of, of women and children. Uh, um, and often, as, as we've seen, whether it be in conflict in, in, in Syria or Sudan, you know, those fleeing conflict really have a, a, a nothing other than victims of somebody else's making uh, and if we can make a little difference, a single difference to one life, even, it's worth the effort. Um, and I think we've, you know, the, the sands have shifted a bit within British Jewry. I mean, you, 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 you referenced our work with, with the refugee community in the UK. In 2016, our then Prime Minister, David Cameron, many, many of you may not remember him because we've had many Prime Ministers since then, uh, um, David Cameron said he was going to accept 20,000 Syrian refugees into Britain, uh, um, having been vetted in effect uh, and being resettled from, from sur countries surrounding Syria. And he reached out to the Jewish community, actually, and said, actually, the Jewish British Jewry is, is largely second, third, fourth generation refugee. You've become pillars of British society. You, you've shown that you can both retain an identity and a faith and yet be fully integrated. What can we learn from that and what can you help bring to the Syrian refugee community that we're bringing? And, uh, and um, uh, 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 one of my colleagues, Janice Lepatkin, 
and my then chair, James Libson, outstanding people, we only have outstanding people working with us, said, let's look and see what we can do. Where's there a missing gap? Where can we add value? And no surprise, the missing gap was helping these people find work, uh, uh, learn a livelihood and integrate back in, into British society, just like we did in the 1930s to the Seven Healthcots and others of this world. And so we've been working really for four years uh, with, with uh, uh, over a thousand Syrian refugees, learn English, find a livelihood, find a job and integrate into British society. And they themselves are the ones who have said, you know, who would have thought we'd have had to leave our homes? Who would have thought we'd have come halfway across the world? But to be greeted at the airport and found a job by a Jewish organization, this dispels all the myths we were ever taught. And, and it's changed our opinions on the world and certain parts of the world, the Jewish people, state of Israel. And if again, we can just change people's opinions slightly, we're not peace builders, so to speak, but it can only be good for, for community and levels of, 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 of tolerance, which you know have been tough in the UK in recent years. Good for the Jews. Absolutely. I mean, also, we, we don't have to look any farther than Israel on the northern border to see Israeli hospitals, you know, in, in mass, massive numbers helping Syrians who Fantastic. come across the border. So uh, I also think it's generational. I feel like younger people, uh, my, my experience, um, and I, I would, would guess it had been similar for you, that, that we see that younger people in some ways, it, it goes without question that this idea of, of our responsibility is, is not only toward ourselves. Not to say that older people only want to take care of Jews, but I think that I, think I see more pushback in terms of this idea of Jewish philanthropy going beyond us, that it's almost a given, that we, they feel almost embarrassed about the idea of only caring about, only taking care of Jews. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's overtly generational in some ways, but I think a bit of it for my parents generation you know survived the war uh, 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 grew up post holocaust a uh, 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 the sense that well if we don't help our own nobody else will and therefore we don't need to help anyone else. and almost almost a peer pressure an embarrassment to be seen to be helping others and yet it was happening in many different ways in many different formats uh, uh, um and we know, you know, Jews have been leaders of many different secular organizations in many different walks of life in many, in many contexts. I think uh, the, the, the younger generation has absolutely, as you, you say, seen, seen it central to a Jewish mission to help change our world for the better, whoever it, it requires it to change, and are bringing their parents and grandparents actually with them on that philanthropic journey. Uh, um, I mean, sadly, I, I mean, I, I'm a great one for saying that a younger generation are more philanthropic today than an older generation. They just don't have the wealth to, 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 to give it. And actually, therefore, that trend is a, is, a, is a positive trend. It's a good trend. No question about it. So you mentioned, you mentioned the Red Cross, which is something I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Before, before you came to World Jewish Relief, and you've been there 12, 13, 12, 13 years. 13 years. Yeah, yeah. Look, there was no gray hair when I joined. People, people who have hair are not allowed to talk to those of us without hair about the, the gray aspect of it. Uh, but okay, uh, you, uh, what, your work with the Red Cross, you visited some interesting places. And you're one, I think, one of the only people, if not the only uh, person I know that has spent time in North Korea. Can you, can you talk, tell us, give us some, besides, you know, in, unless there are some people who are friends with Dennis Rodman, uh, watching, uh, watching the show. I think that you, you might be the only, uh, the only person I know or that many people will have a chance to hear firsthand. What was, what was North Korea like? What, what context were you there? I mean, I assume it was food, some type of aid with the Red Cross. I don't remember exactly, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about North Korea. It's not something that comes up each week on my AMA. Yeah, no, no. Well, well I, I've been very, very, really fortunate in my 33 years of, 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 of international charity work, pretty much most all of it has been international. Uh, um, spending the sort of formative working years in the Horn of Africa, in, in Sudan, Ethiopia and Somalia, which I got to love uh, uh, and, and lived there for the best part of six years. Um, and then with the Red Cross visiting, 
I mean, between between 1996 and uh, 1996 and 2008, uh, pretty much every disaster-prone country of the world, and one of those, I mean, was was North Korea. We had a the, the Red Cross had a a, a a channel into the North Korean Red Cross Society, trying to provide food support to a very challenged society. Uh, um, and I was part of a, a, a British Red Cross delegation to Pyongyang, uh, uh, via Beijing to Pyongyang, uh, um, both to help that civil society organization. I mean, it was, it, was, it was government under a different banner in some ways, both to access channels of food support and to think of ways to distribute it in a fair uh, and equitable way based on need, not just based on sort of entitlement. How long were you? Th how long were you there? Um, I think I only spent six days, probably in Pyongyang. I mean, I, I attended during that time at least four major dance and parade ceremonies. I was feasted upon. I always had a couple of people very close behind me, uh, uh, checking on what I was doing and what I was saying. Uh, um, Did you have any opportunity to interact with people in, in, in sort of any unscripted way, or not really? No, 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 not really. I think um, it was all orchestrated. Of course, for language reasons, there was only a few people that I could speak to. Uh, um, the the uh, my counterpart at the North Korean Red Cross, his it, it, what was amazing about this guy, he he chain smoked, and he could eat spaghetti while still having a cigarette in his mouth, and I, which I thought was absolutely incredible. And I, I don't know many smokers actually today, but anybody who does smoke, I'd be love to see somebody be able to do that. It's not. It's a good party trick. <laughs> well, let's say, well, it's a North. Uh, it's a it's a tragedy what's happening in North Korea, and we'll see what you know how that how that plays out. But uh, yeah, no, it's always. I always feel like I read I read a couple of books about North Korea, and it's just so fascinating that in these in today's world of everything being so interconnected, and we see what's going on, and Zoom, and this and that, and there's just sort of no distance that there's a sort of you know, hermetically sealed kingdom uh, in, yes. you know, stuck, stuck there. It's, it's fascinating. And the South, as South Korea has really been more and more successful, it just makes what's happening in North Korea ever the more fascinating to have this country, wildly successful country split in half from this country that's living in, you know, like a hundred years ago. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you got you got to feel, you got to feel for a predominantly rural population that live off nothing, have no rights and entitlements, survive off nothing, hardly survive, yeah. uh, and um, really sort of uh, 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 barely know what tomorrow is going to hold other than something bad. Uh, so somebody's, uh, there's a question coming in about North Korea. Uh, was the aid given directly to people or had to go to the government to then distribute it? No, it went through the North Korean Red Cross Society mm -hmm. and they had to give us certain assurances over who was getting it and why and on what basis. It was, it was difficult. It was difficult to check as, in as detailed a way as one would like. And, and we, I mean, I, you know, I found in many instances in, in the Red Cross and through my, my humanitarian aid journey, uh, where support, I mean, almost all of our support has always gone through non-government channels, not government channels. But there were risks you have to take. You know, the risk of, uh, of going out of your way to help somebody counterbalance with the risk of some of it being siphoned off uh, uh, and you know we all have a zero tolerance approach to corruption and bribery and, f and fraud uh, um, but uh, but I'm well aware that sometimes your risk thresholds may need to drop if it is about saving life I, 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 in, yeah. in the 1990s I, I again when I was working and living in in Somalia where, where, where it was all out anarchy and civil war and where you had you know, millions on the brink of starvation uh, um, and patrolled by militias who were accountable to no one and wanted bribes at every step of the way. You know, we always had to take a gamble that actually if you flooded the market with food, at least some of it will get through to those that really need it. And, and you know, I mean, I think the, the, the aid sector today has improved on its access and its accountability, but there remain many parts of the world where you can't reach certain vulnerable communities for whatever reasons. Uh, um, and we're probably far less willing today because of the limited resources to take risks on, on losing any of it 
um, and maybe that's you know maybe that's the right way to do it. But it means people suffer further down the line. That's tough, you know. I guess the, what is it? The enemy, the enemy of uh, the enemy of good is great, or the enemy of great is perfect, or you know this idea of you really get into trouble for trying to you know just. You have to shoot for the, you know, you shoot for the bullseye, but with an understanding that you're not actually going to always hit the bullseye. If you expect to hit yeah. it, and shoot. I it think what, 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 yeah. one of the one of the well, the approaches that we've 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 all learned in, in in recent years in trying to make sure that the right people get what you're going to give, what you're giving. Uh, um, two lessons that I've learned. Uh, uh, the first is always a bit controversial. If you give your assistance to women in a family, the, the chances are it's going to be better used. Uh, uh, better targeted um, and less abused. And secondly, That's hardly, giving, su hardly surprising. Uh, hardly surprising. And giving that assistance, if you make it public in the local community, in the local area that we are giving to this village this amount of money to purchase this amount of food for this amount of people, and you put a big sign up, it doesn't need your logo, but you're very publicly telling people what you're doing the power of people holding those in charge to an account is far better than the foreigner doing it. And we know, you know, public openness and honesty in everything we do, which is a difficult concept. It's difficult in, in London. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's difficult in Krakow and elsewhere, but it's a good way of being open and accountable. Krakow is all about openness and accountability. Uh, so maybe bring us a little bit back to Krakow. Uh, going from North Korea to Krakow, uh, maybe a little bit, you know, as, as everyone knows, World Jewish Relief founded JCC Krakow, built JCC Krakow, paid for JCC Krakow uh, on the initiative of, of Prince Charles. Now, I, I think many people have heard the Prince Charles story. I, you know, I, I've, been, I've been milking that one for 12 years. But what did you first think when you heard the, this, this project came to you? Well, I mean, it predates me, uh, um, uh, and my former chairman, Jonathan Joseph, Nigel Layton, are the real architects of this. Uh, um, I think His Royal Highness uh, was initially influenced to build an old person's home in Krakow. He, he really felt and heard the needs of survivors in Krakow. He was immensely moved. He is immensely moved by the needs of older people, particularly survivors. Uh, uh, he's a huge friend of, of, of the global Jewish community, and he is, I mean, he's deeply committed as a, as a, um, a, a, as a humanitarian. Um, he, he, he came to Jonathan Joseph and Nigel Layton, the, 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 the volunteer chairs of World Jewish Relief and a number of others who recognized that there was, uh, uh, in, in talking particularly to our good friends, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, there was a small, vibrant, quite hidden, quite quiet Jewish community in Krakow Bits of it very set in its ways, but bits of it wanting to uh, to have a, a catalyst to do to, to do more, to have a, a space, an independent space, to start to express itself and hopefully to try and attract others in. And in working with the local Jewish community in Krakow and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the the, the concept of building a an appropriate space right in the heart of Kashmir's, which would be a an independent home for those that want to explore their Jewish identity and others that might want to come into it was, was a risk we took. This actually wasn't what traditionally World Jewish Relief did. We were much more about helping extremely vulnerable Jewish communities living in poverty simply survive. We weren't really about peoplehood and community building. Um, and if I'm honest, you know, we focused almost exclusively on the building. The building was, I mean, it was expensive. It was complex. We had, we had to make sure the neighbors were happy and that it fitted in architecturally. Uh, um, and, and, and Mr. Keith Preston, whose, whose name I think adorns part of the building, uh, uh, made that building happen. But if I'm honest, we built the building without really thinking what on earth is going to follow. We hadn't really thought through the plan. I sort of came in at the stage when the foundation stone was being laid and we suddenly started to think this is going to come to fruition. What are we going to do with it? Um, and, and I'm sitting in a cafe in, uh, in Krakow, I forget the cafe, with Stefan Oscar, good friend from the JDC who's still involved. He sits on the, on the council 
of Krakow. And we're thinking, look, we're going to have to do something with this building. It's going to have to become so exceptional because how on earth are we going to fill it? What are we going to fill it with activity wise? How are we going to fund it? Uh, 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 is it just going to be another white elephant of a building uh, across the global across global Jewry? Um, and as we're sort of mulling over a, a nice cappuccino, this really noisy, gobby uh, 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 New Yorker comes in. Can you, a, can you explain gobby to our American? Uh, gobby, just, just full of full of uh, 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 um, hot air, I think. Uh, um, but he was but he was mixing between. Uh, uh, talking English and and fluent Polish, and he had a, a a set of student disciples around him who were hanging off his every word. Uh, and he sat at the table next to us. We got talking uh, um, uh, purely by chance, and he said, "What are we doing here?" Uh, because we obviously looked stuck out like like foreigners in Krakow. And we told him the idea, and and he said, "I'm interested. How can I help?" Uh, and amazingly. You know, about probably about eight months later, after a pretty thorough, tricky recruitment process, looking the world over, we appointed the man sitting interviewing me at this moment. And it was, um, I, I have to say, and again, not because he's sitting in front of me, probably the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made at World Jewish Relief. Oh. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, there were some decisions I made which have been horrific. I, I, I have to say, I, I probably still make bad ones. Um, but but this one was a was a great one, uh, and uh, for you, Jonathan, uh, uh, your 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 team, your volunteers, uh, uh, your partners, uh, uh, different partnerships around you. Uh, um, we know organisations aren't only built on 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 leaders, but it takes good leaders to bring everybody with them, um, and uh, I think you really have created something very very special for you and your and your amazing team. Well, thank you. Uh, it was good. I, I tell you what, ever, ever since then, if I'm recruiting uh, for a new job, I hang around in, in little cafes asking any gobby New Yorkers that come in right. at what they do. Anyone who has, if people have disciples, it's usually a good sign. <laughs> there, why, it seems almost like there are testaments, entire testaments about people who have uh, disciples. Now, I, I, you have to answer a question because I, there's something that I say all the time. And my mother and my wife tell me all the time that I have to stop saying this. When I tell the story of the early days of the JCC and how I got involved, I always tell people that I was the only one in the country who knew what the letters JCC stood for, and that was enough to get me the job. Is that true? No, it was much more than that. Uh, 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 you, you, you had a brain, I think, very early on, you, you, you knew what was missing within the Jewish community of Krakow. You had no preconceived ideas. You were open to thoughts. Uh, uh, you were very welcoming of one and all, respectful of those that were central to Krakow's Jewish community, but open to some new ideas. Uh, um, and, and, and I think brave enough, uh, you know, I, I'm quite conscious that on your first day in the job, I didn't give you a roadmap I didn't tell you this is what it's going to be. I sort of said, you know, you're on your own. Go and find a way to do something useful in the center. Uh, bring people into that center. Uh, uh, find a way to resource it over the next couple of years uh, and recruit some, some exceptional people around you. Uh, and you had the, just the common sense, grounded common sense to do that. I always laugh that on your second day, you were mowing the, the, the grass outside the center because it was getting very long. Uh, um, but actually, you know, there's something about knowing, you know, I, I come from farming stock that, you know, if you know your turf, if you know your land, if you know the land that's underneath your feet, you know what to build on it. Uh, and, and maybe I laugh wrongly at what you were doing there because you were getting closer to the turf so that you knew what had to be on top of it. Exactly. Ha having that was after having read many, many management books, I decided then to go out and mow the lawn to feel, to get a feel. Uh, I think what's interesting always for me looking back is how little, how much of a really little I knew. And then also I have to tell you because, uh, because I have you here in this context and I do tell people all the time that, you know, somebody, I, 
it's interesting to be given something to manage when you have zero management experience. I don't think I'd even actually worked in an office. So even just the way that offices should sort of function was all new to me, which was kind of interesting. But really, uh, I whatever I've learned in this job, I pretty much have learned it from you because there hasn't been a, a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, World Jewish Relief has really been the, the parent organization here and, and, and whatever I've learned about management. So whatever whatever good qualities you've had and bad qualities you've had and I guess we all have both that's pretty much what has uh, come to me since I haven't I haven't uh, learned too much from too many other people maybe not you know start to be a little bit but really if, I, if I've learned from anyone I've learned from you so thank you for that and, I mean, it's uh, interesting uh, Jonathan but it's, it's, it's worth pointing out I know you, uh, that there, there there are there have been and there are many Jewish community centers worldwide. Uh, and uh, uh, not that many of us knew enough about them, but it was impossible and still is impossible to have said to you in 2000 and I forget what your start date was, 2007, eight. Eight, go and see what they're doing in Barcelona or Manhattan or London or Tallinn and copy them. Because we know a JCC can only be shaped and influenced by the community and its environment around it. And so there was no blueprint. There was no menu to follow. There was no guidebook. There was no rule. Uh, um, and you had to invent it yourself. Um, and, and I think that is what is, <clears throat> is worth celebrating. We know all, all management theories is about, you know, take a risk. And if you fail, learn from it. Don't worry about, about, about failing. You just don't want to fail again. Um, and I think, you know, we, 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 <clears throat> we've seen you and your team have tried new things in the JCC, won over your audiences, retained support, grown support, balanced the needs of a local community with the interest from visitors, uh, um, retained great support. You have a vision, a real clear vision for what Polish Jewry should and can be. And, this, and, and the community center is just a central part of that. It's one part of it. Um, and uh, it shows if you know what you if you know where you want to go to, people will follow. Well, thank you. And I have an amazing team. That's true. You point out the team here, and I've been very lucky to identify good people early on and to invest in them and to make them feel part of the team. And you know, it's very. I, I think what people that work for mission-driven organizations as we do, there's an energy that you're never going to find in another place. Now, people can be working in in a bank and be making. 10 times, 100 times the salaries that we're, all, that we're all making. But I don't think you have that same type of energy or feeling of doing something that, that, that you get when you're working in a place like World Jewish Relief or JC Krakow or, or The Joint or UJA or, or, or any of these uh, you know, synagogues or these places that are kind of their, the sum, some eff, their efforts are, are uh, making the world a better place. Um, so my next question of what were you thinking, trusting me with the building, I'm gonna skip. Uh, let me ask you about Krakow. You've been to Krakow many, many times. You're a big fan of Krakow. You guys, you're, you know, WJR trustees, everybody always wants to come to Krakow because it's a fun place. Uh, what, what is it that you really like about Krakow? Um, I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, the, 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 the Jewish history is tough and I find it challenging. Um, and yet, the city and its people. I mean, we know, you know, we know for many years, Brits and Poles, they get on well together. Uh, um, we, we, we love the contribution Polish society has made to Britain uh, for many years and in recent years. Um, and there's a natural engagement. It is probably, Krakow is one of the easiest destinations to get to for Lon from London. There are so many flights and so many, so many opportunities. Uh, um, and there's an ease of, of engagement. Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I get a great welcome when I ever walk into the uh, community center. I think your volunteers are exceptional. Um, and I, I feel that, you know, I mean, I have a great vested interest in the future of that community center and therefore it's exciting to go and visit. It's like visiting your, your favorite uncle in some ways that, you know, he's going to, uh, 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 um, both celebrate your arrival. Uh, give you a bit of pushback, but then listen to some of the good ideas as well. Um, it's not, a, you know, we know uh, um, running a community centre in Krakow is not easy. Uh, it needs great partnership and partnership is is hard at times. It's easier to do things on our own. 
uh, than just to, to do it in partnership. And actually the partnership between World Jewish Relief, Jewish Community Center, JD, the joint American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the local Kamina has been a, 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 an interesting, engaging, challenging at times relationship, uh, which we've all had to navigate our way through. But a bit of that is, I think you like I, Jonathan, if, if, if our lives were easy, we wouldn't do the jobs we do. Uh, we are a bit driven, but we're also driven by challenge and complexity and intrigue. Uh, um, I find uh, um, the Jewish community center in Krakow, the future of Krakow's Jewish community, of Poland's Jewish community, intriguing and thought provoking. Uh, um, and I think that's, I get, a, I, get a, I, get a, I get excitement about trying to address that. Realizing that we can't do it on our own at all. It needs many, many different actors. And I only look at it through one lens. I feel very guilty. I come to Poland, to Krakow. I spend one or two days there. I've never been there for sort of two weeks solid. I don't speak any Polish. I don't really understand Polish Jewish culture or Polish culture as well as I should. Uh, uh, and I think, as you and I know, we have to balance uh, uh, listening very clearly to the needs of local Polish Jews to understand what they want from a community center. And at the same time, uh, um, shape and influence their futures by bringing our own ideas and our own resourcing in some ways to make that happen. And, and, and there's a bit of compromise along the way in, in, in achieving that. And, I've, and I, enjoy, I enjoy, you know, navigating our way through that. Well, a few more, a few more questions as we uh, start to draw to a close. Paul, we were talking a bit before about Ride for the Living, and you're a very sporty guy. You like to run, go around Morocco running, these long running trips, marathons. Have you done Ride for the Living, Paul Anticoni? I haven't. I haven't. I feel guilty. I tell you what, I, I don't know what it is. I think it's being short. Short little legs means that for those cyclists running Ride for the Living, the, the, the short-legged people have got much further to ride, it feels. And that just seems hard. Maybe I'll ride one day on the back of your bike on your tandem, Jonathan. But uh, um, Back of my bike is generally reserved for uh, Holocaust survivors, but we can, it can be Holocaust survivors or people with self-proclaimed short legs. That's also fair. We but ride for the living. I mean, it, it has become, alongside the London Marathon, uh, 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 Richard Branson's uh, Shuttle to the Moon, it's probably the third uh, uh, challenge event that you have to have on your bucket list. We know, um, do it. and uh, those that have done it have never have never not wanted to do it again. And you know, this year we're going virtual, so the barrier is low. Someone like you, who's a runner, you can run the sixty miles over the month. Not a problem for you at all. You've done sixty miles in a day. I'd love to do that. So uh, there question. you have it. Thank a you. firm a firm commitment from Paul Anticoni. <laughs> a couple more questions. Just this, I just thought of this one. I, Biggest challenge for World Jewish Relief, Corona or Brexit? Uh, Brexit's pretty irrelevant for us in some ways. Corona is an enormous challenge. I mean, we are in some ways a disaster response agency. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and, and the virus has clearly impacted every one of the client groups, whether you're old, whether you're living in poverty, whether you're a refugee, whether you're displaced, whether you're a victim of disaster, I think has impacted them hard and we know you know, those that uh, are at risk of the virus, risk slipping into poverty, and those that live in poverty are at greater risk of catching the virus. So I think it has dramatically affected communities we support. Uh, we've got a rise to that challenge. I think the greatest impact for us is inevitably that we're dependent on donations as a charity. It, it, it's pretty much the British Jewish community that supports all of our work internationally. Uh, and as you know, Britain, like every country of the world, has been impacted economically, um, and that's going to be that's going to be tough. Again, if uh, I just go back, if you're clear on what you're doing, if you can show the impact you have, the resourcing will come. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly, virus is important. Brexit. I mean, I, I can't even remember that discussion. In fact, you know, after all the virus chat over the last four months, I can't wait to have a Brexit discussion again. Yeah, it's like, what's the best way of dealing with the Australian wildfires? Well, just have a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> somehow, somehow it puts them out. Uh, very important question for us here in Krakow. Are you team Latka or team Hamantaschen? We do the Latka-Hamantaschen debate 
everybody's on one of the teams. Paul Antacone, Latka or Hamantash? I'm not a big Ashkenazi food fan, if, if I'm honest, but uh, 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 Latka's probably could just pass in a Turkish Salonikis uh, dish, so I'd go Latka. Spice afraid. them, spicy yeah. Latkas. Yeah, yeah. And a new thing that we instituted two weeks ago that we ask everybody, three favorite films, Paul Antacone. Ah, Godfather. Ah. Um, Lord of the Wings, I'm a big fan. And Pan's Labyrinth. It's a sort of a fantasy, historical film, wonderful film. If you haven't seen it, Pan's Labyrinth, worth seeing. I thought you were going with Godfather and Lord of the Rings. I thought you were just going for the longest films. <laughs> Godfather, Lord of the Rings, Pan's Labyrinth. Paul Anticoni, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for your thank time. You. Thank you for everything. Basically, Cracker, done. we love you. We love you. We love you. Be well, Paul. Stay Take safe, care. my friend. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This will draw us to a close. Uh, Paul Anticoni was amazing as usual, as always. And next week, very, very special guest coming to us from LA. Not going to tell you who, but LA in the house next week. So stay safe, everybody. Be well. <laughs>